Hello, everybody. So today we are going to talk about serverless. And since I'm from AWS, right, we are going to talk about serverless on AWS specifically. Right. And uh, before we start, I would like to share with you why I am so excited about serverless, why it's my passion, right? So I spent uh, a lot of time in IT uh, industry and majority of this time I was, uh, I used to be a developer, right? And when I started my career, my first computer looked like that. So it was like really long time ago. But uh, what's important is not like my computer looked like back then, but what, how exactly my development cycle looked like back then, right? So it was ideal for the developer because whenever I have an idea or a problem to solve, I started the development immediately. And then after that, I just push the button compile or something like that, and I'm on production, right? So I have the release. Then after some time, uh, I've got my first job where I was introduced to servers, right? And proper data centers. And so my development cycle changed, changed uh, dramatically. So it still started with the development, right? But after that was not the release, but some boring stuff for me as a developer happened, right? So because before the release, I, need, uh, I had to solve some, some problems. So uh, it was, for example, how many servers do I need to start my application, right? I need to discuss it with an infrastructure guy. And they need to solve, uh, they need to decide how many servers maybe they should to buy or something like that. So it took time. After that, release happened, but Boris stuff didn't finish yet, right? So because after I did the release uh, of the application, even internally, I still had some problems like, who are going to support and patch the servers, who are going to administrate my application or infrastructure where my application is hosted, right? So it was not so much fun for the developer anymore, right? Because it, uh, a lot of boring stuff was happening. So at some point, uh, public cloud came into our life and it solved some boring stuff problems, but definitely not all of them. And then we introduced serverless, right? Our first uh, serverless service, uh, it was Lambda. And if you're not familiar with what Lambda is, so essentially it's a service, sometimes on internet it's called function as a service where you can put your code, you can deploy your code. Uh, by default, uh, six languages supported uh, out of the box, or you can bring your own language, or you can even deploy your container image into the Lambda. And then you need you don't need to worry about what infrastructure under it. So for you, you don't you don't uh, see any infrastructure. The only uh, configuration you might have for the resources is to define how much memory you are going to provide for this lambda, right? And then this lambda is uh, is triggered by some kind of event. Essentially, event is a JSON payload, which coming from somewhere. And in response of that, lambda is running your code, and then can deliver response whenever you want. So it might be another AWS service, it can put something to the database or it's some third party service. So that's essentially what Lambda is about. And it was the first service which basically starts the whole serverless story. Obviously today we have a lot of services which are serverless, right? I'm not going to count all of them. It's just not the purpose of this presentation, but all of them have something in common. We can call it serverless principles or rules, right? So whenever you are go you are looking into the service, if these uh, principles are applied, then the service is, is is serverless, right? So the first principle or the first rule is there are no service to provision and manage for you, right? Of course, under the hood in our data centers and AWS data centers, there are still servers, right? servers. Uh, so it's all running on the servers in the end. But for you, as for the user, there are no servers, there are no infrastructure which you need to, to think about, right? You just put your code or something else that's not necessarily should be a code because there are very different services nowadays, but still uh, you're not worrying about the servers. The second rule is that high, high availability and full tolerance is coming out of the box. So if you're familiar with how AWS infrastructure is designed, so we have the regions, which essentially are the, some, some, some geographical locations. There we have uh, several availability zones and each of these availability zones consists of several data centers. So whenever you provision the serverless server, for example, Lambda, it's automatically provisioned in several data centers, which means if for some reason you don't have connectivity for one of them or it just down because of some event, your application is still up and running. Right, because it's coming out of the box. Again, you don't need to think or design something specifically for that. 
The third rule is uh, it also scales with the usage and it happens automatically as well, which means if you have few users which are using your application, then you have few uh, Lambda environments which is up and running and handling your requests. If the number of users is growing, then uh, Lambda will be scaled automatically in response to that, right? And again, it's not something you need to think about specifically. You have some power to configure uh, some limits of this, uh, some, uh, some limits about this scaling, right? But again, it's not like you you need to to administer the whole infrastructure or specific solutions like load balancing or auto scaling. And if you think about these three rules, how they can help to save you or some money for you or for some, for the customers you are developed for, then you can imagine that you can save a lot of money on the operational uh, cost, right? Because now you don't need to hire a lot of uh, persons who are going to administer your servers, patch them, install some databases on top of it, or some additional stuff like like I mentioned, auto uh, load balancers, auto scale, and all that, right? It's all handled by AWS, and. Uh, here we come to the so uh, for me is for the developer right it's like a heaven so i don't need to think about this boring stuff anymore and uh this the first rule is it last but not least is that uh you pay for what you use and ideally you don't pay for the idle time which means if your service or your applications do not have any users or do not have any requests coming then you you're paying literally zero right and again, from the saving perspective, you can imagine, right? So uh, in comparison with, for example, virtual machine or even containers, which are up and running 24 seven, no matter what, here, if you don't have requests, you don't pay anything. Now with uh, these rules in mind, right? You uh, Now you can imagine um, what are benefits of the serverless, what kind of savings it can bring to you. Let's talk about what you can design because from my uh from my experience very often developers do not use serverless because they simply don't know how to design how to use what kind of services to use how to combine them together and for you for what use cases serverless can be applied right so let's start with uh let's talk about some patterns and start with the common most common one which is rest api so imagine you have a client uh, who who send the response to your API, REST API, right? So, and uh, in response, you have some logic. Uh, so you, you return some response, maybe send some, save something in the database. Pretty common scenario. I would say if you Google serverless architecture, most probably that will be the first picture you will see. So that would be initial design in, in completely serverless. And it consists of three services. The first one is Amazon API Gateway, which is serverless API. Right, it can provide an exposed REST uh, API endpoints. Then uh, there is a Lambda which handles the logic behind this API. And obviously, if you're designing the microservice which has several endpoints, it will be not one, but several Lambdas behind it. And then it's a database for storing the data. Uh, for that purpose, it's all, for purpose of this example, it's also serverless. It's serverless k-value database we have in Amazon, in AWS. Okay, so that's just the start of the design, right? But obviously it's not good, it's not ready for the production because usually you have more than that. You can just start with that, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about how we can improve that. And so uh, the first we need uh, or we want to improve is observability, obviously, right? Because you need to know what's happening inside your application. And for that you have, uh, you have used several services. One of them is AWS X-Ray, which is a tracing, services, a tr tracing service. It allows you to monitor what happens with your requests how long does it take at each stage while request is processing? We are different layers of your application, such as API Gateway, Lambda, etc. So you can identify what is the latency, where did it come from, and so on. Uh, you can also see the visual representation of it. This is one of the way of getting traces of your application, right? Usually when, when you have a monolith, you don't have such issue because you have everything in one place. But uh, if you're running serverless application, it's distributed across multiple services. So X-Ray allows you to see the picture of entire flow of your request. The next thing you look into the obviously logs, right? And uh, everything you write from Lambda to the console, it goes to the service called Amazon called Watch, 
which is service for logs and metrics. So it, it goes there automatically. For API Gateway, you need to activate access logs to be able to see different parameters of API. They're also going to CloudWatch logs. And also there are different metrics which are goes uh, of, out of the, of, of the services. For API Gateway, it generates different metrics about API calls and failures, et cetera. Lambda generates metrics about concurrent and vacations and the time. So it goes out of the box with the CloudWatch. However, maybe you need to add some custom metrics, which may be related with your business logic, right? You can do that as well, and you can publish these metrics uh, using the Lambda into the CloudWatch, and also, you know, uh, anal analyze these metrics later on in the CloudWatch. However, the better way to do that might be not put, not publishing it at, like in the Lambda code, because then it will be synchronous publish, right? It can, it can, uh, it can impact the performance of your Lambda. But what you can do, so uh, the um, CloudWatch has a feature called embedded metric format. When you can put your metric in a specific JSON format into the log stream, right? And, and basically it goes to the log, which is asynchronous, but then CloudWatch recognizes that actually it's a metric published, right? And it converts it as a, as a metric and publish as a metric. So that will be the good asynchronous way to handle that. And um, yeah, maybe you're interested, like, what is this rectangle on the bottom called operations, right? So in AWS, we uh, have a seed called Well Architected. So Well Architected is a set of best practices we collected during the years working with the customers. And it's a way to measure any application or workload you have in AWS against the best practices in six different pillars. So operations here in one of the pillars and these improvements I just was talking about is about improvement in this specific pillar. So I will not, uh, I, I will talk about five pillars, but not the sixth one because the sixth one is the sustainability. And I will not talk about it too much because when you go with serverless, you are automatically at the best sustainability option because you are using only what you need. You are not over provision. Uh, you don't have any idle resources. So from the sustainability point of view, you are good. Now, the next improvement for our applications might be that sometimes uh, we need to, uh, you need to regulate the inbound access rate. Sometimes you just don't want to allow everything that comes in to get in, right? It might be, for example, because you are not using DynamoDB as a serverless database, but relational database, database which are restricted by some kind of infrastructure under it. Or maybe you are using some sort of party API and Lambda interacts with it, and also it can, might be a bit, a bottleneck for you, right? So um, in theory, you can put this limitation about how many requests uh, can go through the API on the Lambda level. It's possible, but it's, I would say, complicated, right? And you can do it just in the beginning on the API level. So you can say, okay, so with this specific API endpoint, uh, it can only accept, let's say, 100 requests per second, no more. So if it will be 100 at first request, you're going to send an error response with 409 uh, error code, and then client needs to retry, right? Another option uh, might be the using of specific API keys for which you apply to the different applications or even different type of users. Let's say you will have different API keys for your premium users who can use, for example, 100 uh, requests per second, and the different set of keys for the freemium users who can call only 10 times per second, right? And so uh, all these features are coming out of the box from the API Gateway. It's one of the benefits of the serverless, right? A lot of things are coming just out of the box. Now, the next thing we would like to improve is the security, obviously, right? Because you don't often uh, just expose the API to public. You want to be sure that whoever is using your API, he is authenticated and authorized to do the actual call. So in this example, it's one of the options and we discuss uh, others as well. So you can use uh, the service called Amazon Cognito, which is serverless identity and access management service, which you can use for managing users, right? Again, in a serverless manner. So users will be authenticated against Cognito and uh, you, will go the, you will get the JSON web token or JWT. And then uh, this JWT will be used by the, uh, uh, for calling the API gateway. And the API gateway know how to verify this token and can decide whether to let you in or not based on this token you provided. Another thing to, uh, to improve in the security is if you think about it in your logic, you can use whether the connection strings to the databases or maybe API keys for third party APIs, right? And if you remember a year or two ago, it was a wave of exposing such secrets uh, 
uh, in a GitHub accidentally because uh, developers just put it hard coded it into the code, which is a very, very bad way to do that. So we definitely do not recommend that. We also do not recommend it uh, to store it even as an environment variables. So the way we recommend to do that is to use some secure uh, secure storages for that, for these type, types of secrets. And again, guess what? We have a serverless service for that called Secrets Manager, right? So you can just put your secret there and Lambda just requests whether it's a connection string or sort by API keys from there. And uh, it can do that only if this Lambda specifically has appropriate role for, for, be, for being able to do that. Additional feature of Secrets Manager might be that if you are using it, for example, for relational databases, that you can configure the automatic rotation of your passwords, of your administrative password for that database as well. Now, the next step, uh, we might in, improve the performance of the whole application, right? So uh, how we can do that? The first thing we can do is to use on-demand billing for DynamoDB specifically, since we are using DynamoDB. What does it mean? It means that it will automatically scale to very, very high numbers based just on demand, basically on your requests. So uh, in terms of performance, it's much better to use it uh, rather than provision capacity, which it also has but it might be more expensive, right? So if you know exactly your usage patterns or against the DynamoDB, so maybe uh, from the cost optimization perspective, it might be better to use uh, provision capacity. Also, another way to improve your performance might be to use regional endpoints uh, in API Gateway, which supports HTTP2 protocol uh, from the client to API Gateway. So you can improve your performance by using that protocol, for instance, for connection reusing or some other things. And the last one, but not least, right, it's about the cost. So how we can, uh, can improve the cost here, even though the serverless solution itself usually is uh, pretty much cost effective. So um, if you think about Lambda, right? So I, I, I told at the beginning that you can uh, identify, you can define how much memory you're going to provision for the Lambda. So the, the one of the uh, billing dimensions of Lambda is uh, how much resources was provisioned for that Lambda for the specific amount of time which where your code were up and running. So you're paying for that. And so you can provision more resources, right? Memory, and then uh, CPU, which is provisioned, or virtual CPU, which is provisioned for that Lambda, it's mapped directly to the memory. And so then your Lambda will run faster. So on one hand, you pay more for the provision and more resources, but on the other hand, you will, your Lambda will run faster. So you will pay less because of the time of execution of that Lambda. And so if you want to try to find the sweet spot specifically for your Lambda, like, you know, sweet spot about the time of running and using of the resources, you can use tools like Lambda Power Tuning, which is developed my, uh, for, of, by one of my colleagues, or you can use AWS Compute Optimizer and AWS Console which initially was uh, used for optimizing EC2 instances, but now it can be used for Lambdas as well for finding this fi uh, sweet spot, right? For optimizing this, for tuning this performance versus cost for Lambda specifically. Okay, that's it for the REST API pattern, right? So the next pattern will be webhook, also very, very common one. So again, that's an architecture we are going to start with, and you can see it's pretty much similar to what we just discussed for the REST API. What's the difference? So the main difference here is that in REST API, when client is sending the response, it uh, it's waiting for the, uh, sending the request, sorry, it's waiting for the response immediately, right? It wants to, to, to receive the response, so in a synchronous manner. With Webhook, actually, it's different. It's more about like a notification service when the client needs just to notify us about something. So it makes the requests uh, over REST API as well, but it doesn't expect to get the answer. It's only expect uh, the answer about uh, that event was received, that's it. And so you can start with the same architecture. Uh, the only thing is uh, maybe we change, we are going to use a relational database there and we call the service called Amazon RDS for that. So traditional relational database. Now, uh, how we can improve that? So first of all, uh, if you're working with relational databases, so you uh, probably use the connection pools, right? Because a relation database usually has the limits in regards to number of the connections that it can receive or keep open, right? So uh, the problem when you're using Lambda and relational database, that first of all, Lambda can scale 
very quickly and in very high numbers. And so you can overwhelm your database and even crush it, right? And uh, so the first thing you can do is to limit the concurrency of Lambda. So basically the limit how much Lambda can scale, how much re requests you can process in the specific amount, in a specific moment of time. So in this example, we are restricted by five, right? And so Lambda makes it sure that it will never have more than five concurrent locations. Another uh, way to improve is to, like I said, if you're if you're working with relational database, you're probably using the connection pools. It's very common practice. But in Lambda, unfortunately, it's it's not possible to use it because Lambda environments are very isolated. They don't have something like shared memory to to share this uh, pool of connections, right? So, uh, but you can use RDS proxy, which is additional service, and your Lambda actually connects to that RDS proxy. And the uh, proxy is actually maintaining the connection pool to the database, right? So Lambda sends requests to proxy, proxy checks if it has available connection and reuse it if it's possible or open another one if it's not possible. And it's also maintain the uh, appropriate connection pool. Additional uh, features of RDX proxy might be that, you know, you don't have to save uh, your credentials in Lambda at all. It, it, it can be handled by RDS proxy. And also it has uh, features like failover as an example. So the next point of improvement uh, might be that uh, actually, instead of immediately trying to process the message, because you don't need it actually, right? It's like a synchronous approach. Uh, you can use the approach, let's store this message and maybe process it later. So API Gateway has integration with other adverse services, not only with Lambda directly. And so here we can use Kinesis. And uh, which basically where you put your, your event or your data, and then uh, Lambda can, can process from the Kinesis data streams. And the reason we're using Kinesis specifically, uh, not SQS, for example, not Qs, is that Kinesis is scaled by shards, right? You can, you can define how many shards you're going to use. And you can limit Lambda concurrency by these shards. So basically how much concurrent invocations will process specific shard, right? And then you, you have pretty much good idea uh, how much connections will be open to RDS in this case. And of course, you need to, main, to configure some dead letter queue in order to process, you know, uh, some, some events which, are, which, were not, which could not be handled by Lambda for some reason. Now, again, we are talking about the notification, we are talking about the security, right? Another way how you can notificate users, in addition to Cognito, right, it can be Lambda authorizer. So how that works? So imagine that you can, uh, that you can have some tricky logic for, for authorization. You cannot use Cognito for this reason. So you can put this logic into the separate Lambda and point API gateway for that Lambda as a Lambda authorizer. So what is going on is that Whenever a request is coming to API Gateway, it tries, it, it goes to that Lambda and basically ask it if it's valid request from the authorization standpoint. And this logic you put into that Lambda, it applies and identify whether it's a, a appropriate user or not. So it's another way to authenticate users in API Gateway. Now regarding the performance, uh, so uh, one, one, one uh, improvement here might, might be that if you have low volume traffic, for the Kinesis, you can actually batch your messages there, right? And use lambdas not for every uh, chunk of data which is coming out of the Kinesis, but for the batches, right? And now uh, also, since Lambda can scale to very high, high numbers for SQS specifically, right? So you can use SQS instead of Kinesis if you're interested in high scale and, and also sometimes SQS can be much more cost-effective than Kinesis in specific cases. And, but they, there, since you don't have these restrictions as shards, uh, so Lambda really can scale for, for to very high numbers, then you can consider to use the memory instead of relational database in the end. So the next pattern, uh, also very common nowadays, uh, it's very widely used for the event-driven architectures. In, it's called fun out, right? So fun out is when you have uh, some message or some data and you want to distribute this data for multiple consumers. And each of these consumers actually will do something different with this message, process it something, something differently. So here you see very common, but actually bad example of how to design the fun out because people operate in the knowledge they, which came from the, from the previous patterns and they try to apply it into the fun out as well. But it's not a good way to do that. The better way would be the first step is to replace the Lambda by the SNS directly because you don't need Lambda to transport the data from API gateway to, for example, simple notification service. 
you need it only to transform the data if you need to. If you don't need to, you can directly put the data from API Gateway to the uh, Amazon SNS, right? And then the uh, consumer subscribe to this SNS and they're just consuming this data which are coming to the SNS. It might be uh, many consumers, not only one. But in our examples, we are using only one consumers which consist of the Lambda and SQS and then in the end it's Lambda which consumes the, the messages from SQS. And again, what we can improve uh, here further. So we can, again, remove unnecessary lambda in between because uh, SNS has a good integration with SQS directly. And also, by the way, instead of SNS, you can use a service called Event Bridge. It's another service which can do the fan out, uh, very widely used in event-driven architectures. And also it uh, has some better capabilities, for example, in filtering messages or feature like archiving and replay events. So you can use whether SNS or Event Bridge it depends on the use case. So now uh, you don't need Lambda in between. Obviously you're using uh, that letter could use for unprocessed messages. And uh, now you are using Lambda just to get, uh, just to process data from the SQS queue, right? And good thing about SQS queue, why you, like in theory, you can get messages directly from SNS without SQS queue. But good thing about SQS queue, again, if you're limited the, in the, the uh, scale out of your Lambdas, then messages or data will wait their turn in, in the queue, right? That's how a queue works. And also if for some reason Lambda doesn't work, then still you have your messages in the queue until Lambda will work. Uh, now, again about the security and again about notification, I, I would like to introduce another way how you can, you know, how you can notificate uh, your users uh, with API Gateway, right? So the third option would be IAM authorizer. That means that client need to use AWS credentials or AWS keys. And in this case, clients use these keys to sign the request. And when API Gateway gets the request, it knows by this signed keys, the role of this client and if he can or cannot invoke the specific API, right? That would be the third way to improve uh, how to notificate user against uh, API Gateway. And um, also, now, uh, maybe a little bit confusing picture, but it's not about the scaling. It's about three different consumers. So you can replace Lambda, for example, by the containers. It will be completely different consumers. Uh, but um, you can do that, right? And of course, obviously, for each of these consumers, it's, it's, it's good to use uh, that letter Q, specific one for each of the consumers. And now what you can improve there, if you think about a uh, previous way, then every consumer actually receives all the messages which are coming from out of the SNS, whether it needs it or not, right? The way to improve the performance of your application as well as, as, well as cost actually, is to put some filtering, message filtering uh, on your SNS or even bridge if you use even bridge, right? And in that, in that case, only specific messages which a specific consumer is needed will go to that consumer, right? So in this example, these messages are filtered by the field status as an example. So first of all, performance will be better. And the second one, uh, since it will be less Lambda invocations in this case for each specific consumer, it will be cost optimization as well. And uh, to continue with the topic of cost optimization, so it might be a good practice to compre compress and aggregate your messages when it's possible. Again, SQS as well as Akinesis has this feature to batch in your messages and then Lambda can, can process not one by one, but by batches. Uh, right, and also uh, important important thing here is that if uh, you are using larger events or larger chunks of data, which are large, the, larger than 265 kilobytes, which is not supported by SQS, so you can use uh, Kinesis instead of uh, instead of that, right? Because it supports one megabytes. If you are using data even bigger than that. You can actually say uh, you can store the actual event in S3 and send the object key from S3 as a as an event, right? And then the consumer will read this data out of the S3 bucket directly. And the last pattern uh, we're going to discuss called streaming. So streaming, it's when you are having a lot of events that come in and you need to process them not one by one, but like you need to process them as a wall, as a stream. Right. Example might be a click stream which is coming from your from your website. And for that again, we have a serverless service called Amazon Kinesis Data Firehorse. So it uh, it might buffers your events in batches, but in a very configurable way. So you can configure how exactly to batch it, whether by a time 
or by size, and also then it's automatically stored, let's say, in S3. Because without this, without the kinesis directly from the Lambda, if you will store any particular event, any particular chunk of data, then you will end up with the many, many, many files on US3, which is not optimal by all means. So kinesis uh, has uh, done this much, much, much better because you have less files that are bigger. And then uh, what you can improve, the first improvement that kinesis inside has some kind of transformations, right? So you can transform data inside the kinesis. You do not have, you do not need to have additional lambda for that. But it's a good practice to save actually your original message message before that, for for different reasons. Another improvement might be that if there are different different type of objects are coming from from your Amazon API, right? For example, click stream and then then mouse movement stream, you need to store them in different places. So you can store everything in one places and then use some ETL for 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 split them, or you can use different Kinesis data firehose streams, or there is a feature in Kinesis data firehose which called dynamic partitioning, where it can partition, or you might think about it as a creating different folders in S3 based on some content from your messages. And then uh, again, the security, right? Apart from the, uh, or in addition to the authorization, another way to secure here might be to obfuscate your messages using the Lambda inside the Kinesis uh, Data Firehorse. For example, if your message contains a credit card number or some PII, which is not allowed to be stored permanently or requires more effort to store it from the regulatory perspective, you might want to get rid of it, right? And you can do that just inside the Kinesis data stream by using additional Lambda uh, inside, right? By custom Lambda inside to obfuscate that. And then uh, another transformation which can happen inside the data Kinesis data firehose, and it's like out of the box, you don't need Lambda for that, is to convert it into some other format and converting your message into some other format. Because by default, your message will be stored as a JSON, right? And if you're using services like Apache Presto, or we have serverless version of it called Amazon Athena, then uh, you will pay for the amount of data which will scan during your query uh, against that data. And for this uh, JSON, this amount of data will be very huge. But if you convert it in some format like Parquet, right, some columnar format, then performance-wise, it will be much, 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 much better. The same, by the way, for the Redshift Spectrum, if you're using it. And um, the last thing about the, again, cost optimizations here might be that, again, you are tuning buffer and the compression, and also you can you might have the additional message filtering uh, in the beginning, right, B before even the initial lambda. So that's all about the patterns I wanted to say. I would encourage you to use serverless. There are a lot of customers who use it in production with these patterns and even more. And actually, we have much more services than I just described regarding the serverless. It's a good approach, very beneficial in, a, not always I would say, but in very many cases. So go build, that's all from my side.